Julian Assange, uh, who you've uh, tweeted about a little bit recently. Why is it bad for Assange to be extradited to the United States? So I'll tell you this story. I, Julian Assange is a friend of mine. I visited him in the Ecuadorian embassy where the CIA spied on us, and there's videotape of that happening and part of lawsuits. But he, I think, is probably the singular figure who is the most pioneering and innovative and consequential journalist of our generation. And the fact that he has been imprisoned effectively for more than a decade, despite having never been convicted of a crime other than the misdemeanor of bail jumping, which is when he sought asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy, um, is kind of shocking when you think about it. But I'll just tell you a quick story, which was at the beginning of WikiLeaks, when they first did the Iraq and Afghanistan war logs, mm -hmm that revealed a lot of secret, previously secret war crimes and the diplomatic cables. Somebody who was a very integral to WikiLeaks, who was a very wealthy person from a Northern European country came to Brazil where I was and met with me. And he said he was pulling out of WikiLeaks because they had become obviously extremely, not just controversial, but persecuted by various governments. And what he told me was, and it's kind of amazing as an American to hear people in like Western Europe, Europe thinking this and saying this, he said, my greatest fear is not that my own government is gonna knock on my door. I don't have any fear of that. I believe in the rights and the protections that they would give me. My greatest fear is that my government's gonna knock on my door and say, we're turning you over to the Americans and I'm gonna end up in the American justice system. Mm -hmm. And you know, I remember feeling kind of amazed by that. Like the last place you ever wanna be is the American justice system when you're accused of national security mm -hmm. crimes. And then once I got heavily involved with Snowden, I saw, you know, there are laws that are written like the Espionage Act of 1917 by Woodrow Wilson designed to criminalize dissent of the U.S. role in World War I. They called it espionage if you even hand a single secret yeah. over. It was what Daniel Ellsberg was charged with, and he wanted to get on the stand and say, I was justified in doing it, and the court shut him down. There's no defense to it. They get put in these Eastern Virginia courtrooms where all the judges are hardcore national security hawks, and all the jurors are you know, CIA contractors and defense contracts because they live in that part of, that's where they purposely bring them, and conviction is all but guaranteed. And it is kind of odd. You think like, why does Assange keep appealing? All he's doing is lingering in a British prison. He's not getting out. But the big fear that he's always had for understandable reasons is ending up on American soil, disappeared into an American dungeon. We have a pretty harsh prison system compared to a lot of other countries. And his conviction would be all but guaranteed. Is, uh, do you think the, uh, the, that first kind of wave of WikiLeaks uh, exposés, was that, was that a major turning point in journalistic history, as opposed to, you know, certainly in world history and things like that? And if so, what did it do? And is it really, is it really powerful or is it just kind of a flea on an elephant's back? Here's why I think it's so innovative and so consequential, because if you think about what a healthy democratic society would be, and you can go back and look at the founding documents of the United States or things that were said at the time, is you're supposed to have a government that knows almost nothing about the citizenry. We're not supposed to have a government that keeps dossiers on us. We're not supposed to have a government that knows everything about us, but that's why we're called private citizens. The only way they're supposed to know anything about us is in the rare case they go to a court and get a search warrant and then can listen on our calls, but the, the, the presumptive rule is they shouldn't know anything about us. And conversely, we're supposed to know everything about what they do. That's why they're public officials. They're public, exercising public power. And a couple of exceptions, again, when there's war, obviously, if they have troop movements or strategies, that can't be known. But the presumption is supposed to be that we know everything that they're doing. This has been completely reversed in the United States and in the West generally, so that we have, as we know, a government that has a massive indiscriminate surveillance system aimed at the American people, collecting immense amounts of information about every citizen, regardless of whether we've done anything wrong. And increasingly, they have these tools that allow them to hide everything beyond behind this wall of secrecy. When I was doing the Snowden story, it took three years to read through you know, millions of top secret documents from our US security state. One of the things that surprised me the most was that every single document, even the most banal, like how you get a parking credential, how you apply for vacation if you work at the NSA, was just automatically marked top secret. It's like reflexively, they hide everything that they do. So it's reverse. We know nothing about what our government is doing, except the theater they let us see, and they know everything about what we're doing. What WikiLeaks did was say, okay, we need a way to blow the hole through that wall of secrecy they've constructed. And what Julian Assange realized before anybody else was that the big vulnerability that they have is now that all information is stored digitally, it's very easy to just 
handed out that that is how we were going to these big massive leaks for the future of journalism when daniel ellsberg uh leaked the pentagon papers yeah. one of his biggest challenges was you know how do you copy forty thousand right. pages like you go to the the, the pharmacy with a big bag of dimes yeah. and do it one by one right. you know that was a you talked to him and that was a major logistical problem for him like he yeah. was very he did that by the way that's part of what he did and that he was scared of getting caught now when chelsea manning you know, did her big leak to WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm. It took her about 25 minutes. She put on a Lady Gaga right. uh, CD and the information was going. And so Julian Assange's realization that all newsrooms use now is how do you allow sources inside the government to hand you massive amounts of digital information and do so anonymously so that you're protected. And some of the most important things we know about our government are directly because yeah. Julian Assange broke those stories, and that's why he's in prison. But has it changed things? And and I don't mean to, I I agree with you. I you know I find Assange's persecution you know incredibly disgusting from every possible angle. I think what he did, and I think what Snowden did, and I think what a, a number of other people have done has been incredibly helpful. And yet here we are, uh, you know, the se Section 702 of FISA was reauthorized with essentially nothing other than a slightly longer than normal term for it. Uh, we know that the government surveillance state just keeps getting bigger and bigger. So is it... Is, is it meaningful or how is it meaningful? So our, let's take this note in reporting, for example. You know, we revealed this incredibly broad, limitless system of mass warrantless surveillance directed not only at foreign adversaries, but yep. the American people. And you can say, well, look, the NSA building's still standing. They still spy, like nothing changed. But the reality is it radically changed the consciousness of people over the planet about their privacy in the digital age. So they were the ones pressuring social media companies like Facebook and Google to prove that they were protecting privacy. All but kinds we've of also since learned that Twitter and Facebook in particular are everywhere hand. are totally in bed, either following the dictates of government or actually asking the government, should I clamp down on this type of speech? Should we report this person? For sure. If you have giant corporations, you're always going to have them working with the government. The government can give them massive uh, contracts, billions of, you know, Amazon has billions of dollars of contracts with yeah. the CIA and the Pentagon. Obviously, they're going to work with them. But there are things And that's like, not even get bringing in the parking companies, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, <laughs> but it also like the NSA very parking franchise. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. why maybe those parking yeah. credential documents were top secret. Yeah. No, I didn't think about it. But, uh, you know, but let, let's take WhatsApp, which is mm -hmm. a company now owned by Facebook. It's the most popular chat um, platform in major countries, right. in, in Brazil, in uh, throughout Western Europe. People increasingly in the United States are using WhatsApp. And within WhatsApp, is end-to-end -end encryption, which really does make it extremely difficult for the US government or any other government to invade those communications. You have encryption that has gone up by you know something like 800% in the first two years after we did the Snowden reporting. These make it much more difficult. So you know the United States is like this gigantic, massive ocean liner. You know, if you want to change direction, it's not some dramatic 180 shift. Immediately you have to turn it and then turn it and then turn it and then turn it a little bit more. And so making people aware of it, divulging their secrets, having people understand a little bit better. But you're right, they, you know, establishment centers of power don't just give up easily. That's why they're establishment centers of power. They have their own tactics. And within, you know, a year of doing this noted reporting, suddenly everybody was scared of ISIS. They're worse mm -hmm. than Al Qaeda. We need to spy on them. After that, in 2016, the next year it was Russia. Russia's interfering. We need to spy on them. So they always feed the population mm -hmm. enough threats to keep people scared and keep people, you know, when the population is scared, they want to give up more authority in the name of keep be being kept safe. So they have their own tactics. But, you know, there's a back and forth at least now, and, and you do what you can and hope that people will, will react.